drive when it's wet and the lights and Thanks for covering for me. It's Monday. But you're here in a couple of Mondays, right? Yeah.
let me know if people are having problems. Sure. Okay. Okay, uh, a couple of announcements. Obviously, everybody knows that our guest speaker, hi, uh, he's our uh, presenter. Uh, our guest speaker, David Bernstein, sent me an email last Friday that he had a very serious medical problem in his family and couldn't make the trip. But fortunately, three of our fellows stepped up to make it more like a journal club session today. Uh, I don't know if Bernstein will be able to come later in the year or not. He was being sponsored by Merck and got to cancel the whole event. Um, the other thing to mention is parking. Parking has become a, a nuisance, so if it's preferable, you still park on the street. It's $6, actually, to park underneath either of these buildings, but I decided we'd subsidize it and cut it in half. So if you park under the building, you only pay three and the I got a couple of emails from people that they drove over here intending to come and couldn't find a parking spot and drove off to work and didn't attend the session. So I figured for three bucks, I didn't want that to happen. It's nice to have people come in person. It's still a better event if you, if you come in person. I, that's my, uh, my feeling. Uh, Drew might say a word or two about the mechanism. So 
And what we need to do is account for everybody who parks. And you can park underneath either building. I'm told it's harder to find a parking garage under this building than the other one, which is obvious off-street parking right as you drive up the street from the Republican. Um, but we have to keep a head count because we have to pay the university three bucks for everybody who parks every session. It's not open to drug reps. I figure you guys make so much money compared to doctors. You don't need <laughs> subsidization. Uh, but we do, especially with Obamacare. Um, today's word of the day is Seattle. Uh, Lisa will be the first presenter. Drew, do you have to make some comments? Yeah, so bring your card in from when you park, and there's a stamp uh, that they will stamp today. Jerry will be our stamp writing down the, the number, and then uh, they'll give it to the attendants and they'll be able to um, start the appropriate billing mechanism. The other thing is Amy is out today, so unfortunately people sending in questions from the outside, we won't be able to answer those today. So you can either uh, text Len right, and I. Yeah, people write to my phone, so if there are questions you can write to my phone or if the broadcaster is bad, you know, let me know. Uh, she no normally sits in the back of the room with a headset on and monitors if she was outside the room and lets me know if the broadcast is good. Okay, so Lisa will go first, and then I think David will go next, and Aaron will go third. So try and save time for everybody. Okay, so... which either can occur from environmental factors like use of violence or due to an inherent mutation of the tube or a mutation that's disrupting the skin barrier. Kind of, kind of the initial um, thing that leads to atopic dermatitis vulnerabilis. So their hypothesis was if they were able to enhance the skin barrier early in life, they might be able to prevent or delay the onset of atopic dermatitis. It's just a schematic from the paper that kind of goes on to um, illustrate what I just discussed. So as you see, if you have some kind of Exciting factors such as a flavor mutation or environmental factors like brightness or irritants or exposure can lead to disruption in the skin barrier as you were asking before. Mike it's, Weiss is saying to speak louder. Okay. I would agree. All right. Um, it's it's easier um, if you have a disruption in the skin barrier for them to terminate it and cut you allergen. Um, and there's uh, theories that have been studied previously that can lead to some mutation um, and things like um, allergen influx can cause the to stem cell to be able to get more key and dendritic cells picking up the antigen. So their thought was, let's use mnemonic to try and prevent this disruption from occurring, and perhaps we can block that in some regard. Got another comment. You guys speak louder still. Do we have a microphone? Or is it not like it's on. Okay, I'll just try and talk as loud as I can. Um, so this was a multi-center randomized controlled pilot trial that was about six months in duration. They recruited infants who were at high risk of eczema, which was defined as having an immediate family member asthma or allergic rhinitis. They excluded several um, other things such as prematurity or people who were prone to having uh, some kind of severe skin disorder that could be a genetic disorder or other serious skin condition that would make it um, difficult for them to do chameleons. So they were randomized to a control and intervention group. The study took place in both the UK and the US, so they had slightly different emollients that were used. They had each an oil-based, cream-based, and an ointment-based um, therapy, and they were able to use either sunflower seed oil um, in the UK was a double based cream versus a cetaphil cream in the US and then again uh, liquid paraffin in the UK versus aquaphil here in the US and the procedure was that the intervention group was to apply this to the dailies um, on a daily basis to the baby's entire body surface um, shortly after birth so they defined that as being within three weeks of birth until six months of age the main clinical insight was looking at um, week 24 with a cumulative incidence of 
they followed up with the patients by telephone at pretty regular intervals, and they also had some in-person clinic visits at 12 and 24 months. The final visit was used to uh, do blinded assessing of the skin by a dermatologist. And they classified the patient as having eczema if either the investigator or any other medically qualified person, such as their general practitioner, had diagnosed the infant with eczema at any point during that 24 weeks. This is just a table showing the baseline characteristics. So they stated that they felt the control and emollient groups had fairly similar, similar baseline characteristics. Um, there would be a slightly higher amount of flavor mutation present in the emollient group versus the control group, but otherwise uh, fairly similar. And with regards to adherence, uh, they ended up stating approximately 85% of those in the emollient group um, were using their emollient at least five days a week, if not more, uh, by the end of the 24 week time period. I should note they initially had 124 infants that were included in the study, but there were about 16, seven in one group and nine in the other that were not able to um, continue follow up for various reasons, although they stated the emollient use was not one of those reasons. Um, what they ended up finding was that daily emollient use did significantly. was 43% in the control group versus 22% in the emollient group. So that was a relative risk reduction of 50%. What was the control group again? So the control group, they were both um, infants that were at high risk for eczema defined as having high risk um, immediate family members who had uh, significant age defeat. And they basically just started the randomized intervention group from shortly after birth on emollient use, and the other group did not. Have just nothing. No therapy. No. They mentioned that there were a handful, I, I want to say around five, maybe to seven patients in the control group that did have some emollient use, but they decided to just keep them in the control group to see if that made any difference, um, but not on a daily basis as was instructed at the treatment group. Um, because they had some missing data, they did some further sensitivity analyses to try and further strengthen their results, and they said that three of these four scenarios um, were pretty similar to what their actual data looked like, so I'll show you that. So again, the complete data set that they had was just from the 108 who they were able to get good follow-up from. And again, the control group had an incidence of approximately 43% to 22% of the emollient group. So what they did by um, looking at the missing data, they concluded that either um, the people who were all missing were all going to develop atopic dermatitis or they like, all going to not develop atopic dermatitis. In both those scenarios, as you can see, the um, incidence and relative risks are fairly similar to what they actually got. In the worst case scenario, they would assume that everyone who was missing from the emollient treatment group would have gone on to develop atopic dermatitis. Best case scenario would be the opposite of that. And as you can see, only their worst case scenario was, was the one that didn't really line up in terms of what they were seeing with their numbers. So from their data, they were able to conclude that they felt emollients potentially could correct a subclinical skin barrier dysfunction that's not apparent in early infancy and thereby um, prevent early inflammation that might predispose these infants to developing atopic dermatitis. Uh, they do feel there should be further studies that would uh, address the potential for how this might affect sensitization, as we didn't really look at that in this, and also to look more closely at which particular emollient uh, may be the best to be used in this scenario. Uh, they did mention that there was uh, comments from the treatment group that they felt that the cream gel-based versions were better than the oil and even better than the ointment. Um, and then they, I acknowledge there were some limitations, including the short follow-up time and the small number of participants in this pilot study. Um, they said, you know, it's possible that some of the patients in the treatment group may have had a mild eczema that was somewhat covered up by this emollient use, or perhaps something would be seen further out from the six-month mark um, that was just kind of the, the um, um, constraints that they, they set for their study. So uh, I thought it was interesting to, to see what results they got with regards to possibly preventing that I wanted to go on and discuss um, another There's two paper. questions before you yeah, go on. Sorry. One is, I, what little I know about pellagrin, there's a whole spectrum of severity from people who have like ichthyosis to milder defects. Did they characterize any of that and more or less say you can correct for a mild phenotype of pellagrin abnormality that's really severe, so, this wouldn't have any effect? Yeah. And the other is, Really, you need long-term data to say, like, years later, did this really make any difference, or you were just watching it while you were applying it? So did they comment on either of those? They did comment on the follow-up time, as I mentioned, maybe not did it justice.
justice that they said that um, given that they only watch these patients for the first six months, they're not able to really talk about the long-term um, course for those patients, and they felt further studies were needed to address that. Um, and then with regards to your other question, sorry, could you rephrase The severity the of the flagrant right. defect. So they didn't go into detail about that. Um, they did state that they looked at who had flagrant mutations and what the percentage in terms of instance was in each group, uh, but they did not characterize the severity of flagrant mutation or you know, if um, those who had flagrant mutations were the ones who happened to manifest signs of ectopic dermatitis in the first six months. They really didn't go into much detail with regards to that. Um, any other questions regarding this paper? Just another sort of proof of concept, mm -hmm. although I suppose the answer is the numbers aren't big enough. Did they also look at the ones that were totally compliant versus less so, versus less so? No, um, no it's not outlined in the paper, although as they claim um, from the telephone and visits that they were reported from the families that it was about 85% group compliance Pretty and close. five to seven times a week. So um, from that, they didn't really do a Probably not enough for the others. Mm -hmm. Any other questions regarding this paper? Was it blinded? Um, it was randomized. I don't know that it was blinded. Um, it was supposed to be blinded, sorry. Um, they had um, the actual face-to-face -face visits were conducted by a blinded uh, dermatologist. Um, I don't know the details of the Okay, so um, kind of tying into this, this next paper talks about flavor mutations. And uh, this particular group has done some uh, pretty involved peanut exposure um, in children early on in life, particularly in children who have loss of function to labor mutations, and what the effect of that might be with regards to sensitization and peanut allergy. So um, in this case, um, they start off by saying, we know there's a clear association between early onset atopic dermatitis and food allergy. Um, we know that filigrin is important for the strength and integrity of the stratum corneum, and we talked a little bit um, earlier about how it's important for regulating influx of antigens and water. Uh, loss of function mutations in filigrin actually are present in upwards of 50% of patients who have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, and we know from previous studies that filigrin is associated with increased risk of sensitization to inhalant allergens, peanut, uh, and perhaps other issues with allergic rhinitis and asthma. So what they were interested in, in knowing is um, the amount of peanut protein that the patient is around in their environment on a daily basis, how might that affect Previous studies have shown or seem to link uh, household member consumption of peanut with um, uh, increased risk of peanut allergy in the child's first year of life if the uh, consumption level is high. The previous studies haven't looked in much detail about the objective data, how much peanut protein is actually in the environment. So this group looked at the peanut protein in household dust, and in the previous study noted that it was positively correlated with a high amount of household peanut consumption, and that this was actually by biologically and could cause um, basal activation in children who had peanut allergy in a dose-dependent manner. So their hypothesis was they felt an increase in peanut protein in the environment um, could potentially cause um, increased amounts of peanut sensitization in school-aged children, and, and this would be augmented in children who had one or more flagrant loss of function mutations. So they had quite a large cohort that they used to do this study. Um, they used uh, validated questionnaires um, to um, get information from the parents regarding the symptoms and other physician diagnoses for these patients. Um, the parental report of atopic dermatitis was assessed via um, a standardized questionnaire. And they looked at rates of peanut sensitization at ages 8 and 11 years, both by Stanford testing and by um, blood tests as well for both whole peanut as well as um, era age 1, 2, and 3. So their definitions of peanut sensitization and allergy they wanted um, a skin prick test that was at least three millimeters um, in size and a specific IG to peanut to a whole peanut that was 0.2 or greater. And then for components, they wanted an IG um, to ARH1, 2, or 3 greater than 0.35. Um, they then looked at the children that they characterized as being sensitized, and they were offered oral food challenges to determine if they were allergic, unless they had a very convincing history and other um, supporting labs that seemed to cement that they clearly had a peanut allergy and therefore did not need a and they considered the world challenge positive if there were two objective signs of a immediate reaction. Um, other things they did was collect dust from 
and all of the subject's parents' homes, approximately 36 weeks of gestational age for these subjects. Um, if they weren't able to pledge to the antenatal sample, they then did so at approximately six months or 12 months of age. Uh, and then they analyzed how much peanut protein was present in the dust by doing an ELISA against the actual peanut protein. Um, they stated that they were able to determine the lower limit of concentration for the ELISA was 0.5 micrograms per gram. Um, and they further went on to do flagrant genotyping for all of these subjects for the six most common mutations that are found in the Caucasian population, and those with atopic dermatitis. Um, I'm going to just skip to this slide for a second. If you want to follow along with this, it's kind of the, the little flow chart that goes through and tells you how they got to uh, the numbers that they got to. But as you can see, initially they have 11 184 children in the cohort, and they were able to uh, include only 623 of these because they had to take out those who were non-Caucasian based on the flagrant um, genotypes they were looking at. Um, they had to make sure they had those genotyping results available for all these subjects and that they had available dust samples for everybody. Um, and so that ended up getting them down to 623 subjects. You can continue to look at that if you want. I'm just going to kind of go through the numbers in a little bit more detail. So from those 623 Caucasian children, for which they had genotyping and peanut exposure data, um, they looked at them at eight years of age and found that 70 of them were sensitized by the parameters that I mentioned earlier. There were a few that had um, been noted to be sensitized even earlier than that at five years old. One was not sensitized but had a uh, report of a reaction on peanut exposure. And then the remaining 520 um, had no peanut sensitization or reactions to peanut. Uh, and then there were a few for which they did not get data so of the 71 who had either sensitization or a history of reaction, there ended up being 20 who they were able to classify as peanut allergic, seven of which um, they did not undergo an oral food challenge. As I, as I mentioned, they had um, fairly high skin care tests and specific IgE and a few minutes of history. Um, the remaining children were invited to do an oral challenge. 11 of those were positive. There was one subject they couldn't get in contact with, and there were quite a few that refused. Um, two of those that refused were later classified at 11 years of age when they underwent further skin care tests, IgE, and data collection. And then there were 38 that were found to be sensitized but did not have a positive oral challenge and therefore not classified as being peanut allergic. So again, this kind of convoluted uh, flow chart will get you to those same conclusions. I was just trying to summarize it in an easier way. Um, table one looked at the baseline characteristics of the group and they wanted to show that those that were included in the study versus those who were excluded had fairly similar rates of um, sensitization and other And what they ended up finding was that there were flagrant loss of function mutations in about 90% of all children. Um, and four out of the 20 children with peanut allergy, or 20% of them, had flagrant loss of function mutations. Uh, they described that infantile atopic dermatitis was present in about a third um, and present in 80% of the 20 peanut allergic children. Um, of the 16 children who had peanut allergy that did not have a flagrant mutation, 80% um, of those approximately had atopic dermatitis. Uh, and the other thing they wanted to note was what the median peanut protein concentration in the household dust was. That was 0.73 micrograms per gram, which was above the lower limit of detection, which was 0.5. Uh, however, they note that about a third of households did have uh, levels that were lower than their lower limit of detection, which again was 0.5 micrograms per gram. Um, this chart is basically showing you the various um, demographic factors that associated with skin prick test sensitization and peanut allergy. The main things that associated with it were having moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, uh, flagrant loss of function mutations, ever having a history of hay fever in the child, and egg sensitization. Uh, that's the link here. Uh, another thing that they noted, which I'll show you on this chart again, um, is if you look at the second line from the bottom, the peanut protein and dust did not seem to associate with higher levels of skin prick um, uh, testing sensitization to peanut or peanut component or peanut allergy. However, they then went on to do a more detailed analysis looking at the interaction between flagrant genotype and the early life exposure to peanut in the environment. And they found that that interaction actually strongly associated with increased risk of sensitization to peanut and had a trend toward uh, peanut allergy as well. This uh, table is very difficult to interpret if you're not a statistician, but basically um, in the middle here, uh, they talk about the interaction between flagrant and peanut and dust, and that's where they're getting these if you look at this chart as well, though, the very top line will tell you that we already knew this from previous studies, but flagrant loss of function mutations in and of itself 
will pretty significantly increase your risk of peanut sensitization and peanut allergy. So they go on to say that this interaction of having the flavor mutation and having higher exposures of peanut in your environment at home will further um, increase your risk of sensitization and allergy. Um, this uh, is basically showing uh, in the solid line you have patients with loss of function flavor mutations. The dotted line is wild type. And they're showing that as you get higher levels of peanut protein, um, the increase in risk um, basically is correlated with those higher levels of peanut protein in those who have flavor and loss of function mutations. And what they determined here was basically what the threshold was for being at more risk for sensitization and allergy. Um, and so if you look, this was a lot of statistics as well, but basically the 0.92 micrograms uh, per gram, the 1.03 and the 1.17 are there thresholds for increased likelihood of peanut sensitization, component sensitization, and peanut allergy, which are all about two times the lower limit of quantitation. Um, and so they wanted to point out that that's a pretty low amount of peanut that these patients um, seem to have a threshold for them developing a uh, greater likelihood of becoming sensitized or allergic. Um, in conclusion, what they found was that for those who had flavor and loss of function mutations, there did appear to be a dose response relationship present between higher amounts of peanut protein in the environment in household dust and subsequent development of peanut sensitization and allergy. Um, each natural log unit increase in house dust peanut exposure was associated with an increase in the odds of sensitization and allergy for peanut. Um, they found that even though this was not true for those without flavor mutation, the interaction between the flavor and mutations and the peanut dust exposure did seem to be um, pretty consistent and significant. And based on this, they, they feel that um, this could be important for uh, uh, understanding how this exposure in flavor and lots of function mutation children might influence the development of their sensitization and allergy. Uh, I found this study to be interesting, uh, but uh, not sure how feasible it is in terms of applying to clinical practice. I mean, uh, it's interesting to note that those who have flavor and lots of function mutations may be at a higher risk of becoming sensitized if they have higher amounts of peanut protein or peanut consumption in their homes. Um, but uh, I'm not sure how feasible it is to actually screen for flavor mutations in their patients. And it seems that those who still have peanut allergy and have no issue with flagrin, um, you know, it's not necessarily applicable for those patients in terms of preventing them from becoming sensitized or allergic. Um, basically, they felt their limitations were that they weren't able to include more patients in their cohort that they had a small overall uh, number of patients who had peanut allergy from which to kind of make these conclusions and that they weren't able to include um, non-Caucasian individuals, although they noted that 95% of their cohort was Caucasian, so they didn't feel that that um, disrupted things too much. Lisa, I'm going to take the prerogative to move you yeah, away. I'm done at this um, point. But, um, the, the, com the comment I would make while we're getting the next speaker, David, up there, I, I always am what to do with people who are sensitized but not allergic. They had the majority of people in that category, which is still very confusing and frustrating. All right, so David, she didn't speak loud enough. You've got to use the Hebrew to English interpreter device, so I don't get a lot of criticism that nobody knows what you're saying. <laughs> Just because you're being nice. All right. Yeah, unwrap your paper now. about the new guidelines, the new guidelines uh, for CDAD, and I know that the fellows already heard of them, so I apologize for that. Please pretend that you're being surprised and shocked by the evolution of the uh, guidelines. Um, so just a quick overview on how PISO develops. So PISO develops first, they start at the bone marrow. Um, they are coming from the uh, common stem cell, common lymphoid progenitor. Uh, the next step uh, would be to arrange uh, the heavy chain, and these are the early pro B cell and the late pro B cell uh, steps. Once the B cell already arranges heavy chain, you can move on to the next step, starting to arrange the light chain. That's the large pre B cell. First, they divide a lot, and then when they are in the small pre B, uh, B cell in phase, that's when they actually arrange uh, the small the light uh, chain, and then they present a BCR on their surface, and they are becoming immature B cell. But that's not enough. Then they leave the bone marrow, they move to the periphery, secondary lymphoid organs. Lymph nodes all the stream where they can take several paths. Um, at one point they will see 
an antigen, and then they'll, they're developing to mature B cells and memory B cells. They'll either become plasma cell, which secretes antibody, or they can also class which and make different antibodies, or they can become memory B cells. And I mentioned this review. That was a very challenging review. I still have it next to my bed, and I'm trying to read it about once a week. Never went all the way through. Um, but that's a nice review going of overall the known primary antibody deficiencies with the genetic defects. And what it basically says that you can have defects in multiple steps on the way, so either in the development of the B cells, like ADA deficiency, AKQ, data feed deficiency, all these steps are required to generate the B cells. Um, RAG, RAG1, BTK, we all know of these, we know all these obviously. But there's another, the next step, once the BCR, the BCR is already out there and has to signal through the BCR, there are many other defects that can um, cause abnormal signaling and abnormal antibody, uh, uh, abnormal antibody uh, secretion. So that will include CD19 complex, CD21, CD81, CD20. What is important to remember that all these defects are not CDAD. Because part of the definition of CDAD is that you don't know what the genetic defect is. So I'm not going to talk about any of these. Um, so common variable immune deficiency. Why do we call it common variable immune deficiency? First, because it's common. So the prevalence is like 1 to 25 to 50,000. It's probably the most common primary, primary immune deficiency, although I'm not sure if we call it primary. Um, and if you check the European uh, registry, then about 20% of the immune, immune deficiencies are CDAD. It's variable because it has variable presentation with one infectious complication, and also probably represent a variable group of diseases, not a single disease. Uh, I don't know if it's polygenic disorder, it's something that we can say to describe CKD, or is it autoimmune disease, and I don't know if anyone really wants a good answer. And obviously it's immune deficiency because you get more infection, so it's common variable immune deficiency. Um, there are some problems with the diagnostic criteria, and basically there's a problem to define diagnostic criteria. First of all, because the presentation can vary between different patients, so I don't know if you can find one um, set of criteria to define a disease. Um, the hallmark of CVAD is hypogammaglobulinemia, which is a con uh, consequence of LOAT. LOAT is a nice uh, way to describe it, so it's late onset antibody failure. Most patients have IgG level of less than 500, most have reduced or undetectable IgA and IgM. Um, once we started doing uh, B cell immunophenotyping, and people are trying to push in that direction, so then we, already, we also studied that there are some abnormal, uh, abnormalities in the B cell phenotyping. One of the most significant criteria is the loss of uh, switched memory B cells. Um, some of these patients also have T cell defects, and they are categorized, they are classified as CDAD plus or something like that, but that they should actually be considered as a different disease. And one paper that I read suggested to call them lossy, so they will be late onset combined immune, defi immune deficiency. So it's either late onset of combined immune deficiency or late diagnosis of combined immune deficiency. Um, in addition to lab the findings uh, of low antibody level, we know that there are also other characteristic uh, features, either histological or clinical. So some people can have Bernalotus disease, liquid aplasia, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, something which is um, special or could be a diagnostic clue in the diagnosis of CVAD is the absence of plasma cell in GI biopsies. So if some, some patients have um, inflammatory bowel disease or some enteropathy and you get a biopsy, you don't see any plasma cell, then you should think about CVAD. I'll skip that. Um, so what are the diagnostic criteria until a couple of months ago? We, so far we're using the ACID package that's the Pan American Group of Immune Deficiency Criteria from 1999. Um, Need an IgG level uh, below um, two standard deviation below the mean, which means that below the 97.5 percentile, which means that 2.5 percent of the population needs, needs to fill that criteria. So I hope that there will be 50 patients here. Do have people here? Then you can have one people here as it, but we don't have it. So, so it should be very common if you um, follow that criteria. Yes, you also need to have low IgA or low IgA. Second criteria, criteria will be impaired vaccine challenge and absent uh, hydramoglutinins, and no other secondary cause for hypogamma and globulinemia or any other uh, genetic cause. And when you check the initial criteria, then the age should be uh, above two years, which is a relatively uh, young age uh, because there is other um, other possibilities such as genetic uh, diseases 
or trans the type of amount of trans. And this is uh, the paper which describes the criteria. The major reason they are the reason that I'm showing that because they are, we're actually describing all the criteria for the different primary immune deficiencies, and back in 1999, there were only 13 primary immune deficiencies. It was very easy to be an expert in the PI disease at the time. Um, so How many do we have now? It's not fair because I mean, they, when one of these will be skipped, so it could be developed genetic yeah. disease. We have between 250 and 300 with no monogenic disease. What is the problem with these criteria? They don't say anything about symptoms of clinical manifestation. So I don't know, if you have a patient with 400, IgG of 400, no problems, no infection, but they have CBAD, do you need to treat him? I don't know. They don't men mention anything about other immune, con uh, immune consequences, granulosis disease, lung disease, gut disease, no mentioning of any histological finding, um, and they don't say anything about beta phenotyping, which we are now doing more and more. They don't also don't say anything about genetic with CBID like, and you need CBID like because once you have the genetic disorder, this is not CBID. Uh, so, obviously, something or things are missing. The biggest problem, and um, Jordan also mentioned that um, in the last uh, meeting, um, that they define full response to vaccine, but they don't say anything about the vaccine. Um, which vaccine do you need to test? What's, what is considered as full uh, response to vaccine? For example, if you have a patient with low IgG and mildly impaired response to diphtheria, it will be considered CBAD. But diphtheria is a very uh, challenging uh, vaccine and a lot of people don't make antibodies to diphtheria, especially at an older age. So you could take somebody at the age of 65, 70, um, borderline IgG, no response to diphtheria, you can find him a CBAD and start him on anti-aging. Um, some patients could have vaccine-specific memory be cell following immunization. So let's say that you received the vaccine years ago, you still might have some memory B cell, and even though, that you, even though you're losing your new B cells and you don't make any new antibodies, you might have some memory B cells, and they are the ones who will respond, who will respond to the vaccine. So you get a patient with a perfect history, a lot of infection, he has low IgG level, you give him the vaccine and great response. But a great response is not because he's able to make new antibodies, just because he has good memory B cells, and they are the ones who will respond. Another interesting fact is that um, a lot of CVAT patients respond to, um, to vaccine, about 80% patients will respond, will respond to the moon packs. On the other hand, there is a risk for unresponsiveness with repeated doses, and I'll mention that in a second. New antigen or possible alternatives, either the bacteriophage or radius that is not easily available. Um, so that could be a solution, but it's not as easy to uh, achieve. Um, these are some papers to um, explain the problem, problems with vaccines. So for example, active vaccination in patients with common viral immune deficiency. This is one study you took patients who were already on IVAG, you made sure that their trough level was relatively constant, you gave them the vaccine and checked for the variability or increasing the um, anti pneumococcal titers, and about 80% of the patient actually had increase in their uh, anti pneumococcal titers. Um, the percentage was higher when they were challenged with um, polypeptide vaccine. Um, this is another one, uh, which I think it's more interesting because the way it was presented that with age, people do not respond to the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. But when you actually read the paper, then it says something different. If you take patients around the age of 45 and compare them to patients 65 or older, then you will get normal response. The patient will respond in the same way as far as it's concerned to the antibody titers. If you check, like a functional essay, to check the opsonization and efficacy of these antibodies, you will see that in older age, people are making the antibodies, but they're not able to opsonize the or kill the bacteria. So normal levels, but abnormal function of the antibodies. So you can get the same history. The patient has a lot of infection, maybe reduce antibody levels, you give them a perfect response, but still they might not function. Um, another problem. So that's a combined a paper about combined schedule. That's actually a review for mass of infection. This is in 2007, raising the concern that if you give a patient the same vaccine over and over again, you might actually induce hyper response. It was first described with the pneumococcal vaccine. They started with the infants, giving them um, the vaccine at three months of age, seven months of age, and again at 12 months of age. And there was no increase in the memory uh, response observed, and actually the antibody titer was declining with repeated uh, vaccination. The same was also described with the PPV, and if you think about it, that's exactly what you're doing every time. So you start, you have the suspected patient, you give him the PPV, uh, the uh, pneumofax 23, you check it after that, you don't get any response. 
we say, okay, maybe let's try to give him a nice second dose. So we give him a second dose, and again, no response. So then you send him to the immunology clinic, and we think, you have only 14 serotypes that you can check, we can take 23 serotypes. So we give him a third dose, but then no response at all. Um, so all these are concerning issues, which I don't know if we think about it uh, every day. And this is uh, the last interesting thing, and I think I already mentioned that. What is a normal response? So if you go and try to check the references, where did they come with the number 1.3, which we are all using, but this was an LVAX. Um, it was first mentioned in 1998 uh, by Sorenson, uh, who wanted to check the response to a uh, focal vaccine, and he says that um, response to individual serotypes was arbitrarily defined as a protein immunization antibody concentration of 1.3. Um, so why? Because, just because, that's what my son uh, tells me all the time, um, and the conclusion is great. The definition of what uh, constitutes an adequate response to pneumococcal immunization needs further definition. So 1.3 is a great number. We don't know. We don't have any idea how they how they came to this number. Um, so these are not the new diagnostic criteria. This is a suggestion for new uh, diagnostic criteria. It was suggested by uh, a guy from Australia and New Zealand. I don't know exactly where he sits. Um, he tried to emphasize both the clinical and the lab findings. Um, so patients had to meet four, criteria, four categories, um, which are applied sequentially. So you start with one, you don't fulfill the criteria, you don't go to the next. The first category is basically the old guidelines, you need an IgG of below 500. Age this time needs to be about four, and no other causes. Um, and then you can ask yourself, okay, so I have a patient who might have CVAD because he has low antibody uh, levels, I don't have any other reason to explain that. No one has to ask myself, does it mean anything? So the second category will be, does he have any sequela uh, attributed to immune system failure? So does he have recurrent infection? Who responds to antibiotics? Um, I don't know if I agree with that one. Infection is quite of appropriate vaccine, especially with the HPV, which is supposed to be disintermediated. But does he have other findings, like bulky ectasis? That's basically means that he already had a lot of infection and he had head organ damage, so maybe we missed him uh, already. And also, does he have other inflammatory disorders or autoimmunity? So not only the immune deficiency, but other organ involvement as well. And then you can ask yourself, okay, so I have the uh, initial lab finding, I have the history, do I have other supportive lab uh, evidence? And that will be reduction in other, in other antibody uh, classes, IgA or IgM. Do I have abnormal B cell uh, phenotyping? We reduce B cell uh, memory B cell or decrease PD-21 load subset. And that has to be checked twice. Why? I don't know. Maybe the guy has a new diagnostic lab. I don't know why. And does he have subclass deficiency? Does he have abnormal response to vaccine? But this time they define what the abnormal response to vaccine is. So tetanus should be about one uh, international limit. Uh, most recent years are about one. And Lupax, um, 70% in uh, adult patients and 50% in uh, pediatric patients. Um, that's something that we don't do here. Jordan also mentioned that, that you have to repeat that after six months to see if the response was, trans was transient. But all of these are criteria that can add to the diagnosis of CBAD. And then, if you don't have any lab criteria, you can still make the diagnosis that's based on other histological markers. So if you have interstitial lung disease, uh, gonorrhea disease, liver disease, a GI disease, you can still um, make the diagnosis. And that's a flowchart that you can follow. So first, do I have um, some suggesting clues? Maybe if I have them, then do I have the lab result to suggest that? If I do have it, then I can either uh, look for more specific lab findings or uh, histological findings. And two nice thing about, things about it, um, treatment is recommended based on the criteria, and I like this, this HGAS, something equivalent to the MGAS that the oncologist said, uh, so that would be hypogamma of undetermined significance. So these are the pages that you can put them on your waiting list, think about them, maybe screen them every year and see that they're being, they're being looked at. Um, so the revised acid registry criteria were published um, 32 days ago. Um, similar to the one that I just mentioned, people are required to have symptoms of their immune deficiency, so antibody deficiency by itself is not enough. Um, low antibody levels are required, it has to be checked twice. Uh, vaccine response is required, but you can go around it, so if you don't know how to evaluate it, Get normal response, but the patient is still suspicious. You can uh, support your diagnosis with um, other measures. Um, again, patient has to be older than four years of age to, ex to exclude monogenic diseases and transient hypogamma deficiency. 
you need to exclude severe T cell defect, and that's something nice uh, because you need to remember that the T cells do not act by themselves. You need the T cell support, and sometimes when you don't have antibodies, it's because of a T cell defect, and that's actually changed the way you think about your patient because then you might need uh, to give it prophylactic antibiotics, you might need to think about more aggressive treatment, and then that might put them in a different category. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can make a diagnosis of CDAD even when the patient is already on replacement therapy without um, having go through the uh, purifiers or the on treatment channel. So what are the criteria? And this is the link for the criteria and also, um, it's also attached to the presentation, at the end of the presentation. So first, you need to have at least one of the following clinical symptoms, increased susceptibility to infection, autoimmune manifestation, colorectal disease, um, or any of the others. And the nice thing about it is even if you don't have uh, history of infection yet, um, autoimmune manifestation by itself probably should raise a concern for CVAD. And we know that about 20% of the patients have their first manifestation will be autoimmune manifestation even before the, they develop the low antibody levels and the infection. Uh, so once you have the, the right history, you should have the uh, reduced uh, antibody levels. And David, what does the uh, affected family member mean? It means that if you have a historic family member, let's say, with IgA deficiency, for example, you have 20% risk to, get, to have CVAD. So family member, family history by itself could raise... Uh, so even, even selective IgA. Even selective IgA, especially selective IgA. Okay. I think they meant to say selective IgA, 20%. David, I want to make sure Aaron gets up there, so I'm going to cut you off here. Okay, so we have it at the end of the presentation. The last thing that I wanted to say, um, criteria don't replace clinical judgment. So if you have antibody levels, you feel the patient is doing okay, you know that if the patient has other kind of suggests that you already suffered complication of IVIG, of a CVID, please treat him, um, and we're not looking for a job. <laughs> So while, while Aaron's walking up there, I just want to ask you, are things like granulomas disease and some of the other things, are they complications of having infections, or are they part of the primary disease? I think once you, I mean, especially when you have it in the lung, so yeah, you should look for an infection, but I think they're part of, um, part of the initial They're part of the primary disease. Yeah. And if you give them, you know that if you treat, well, most of the time when you give treat, treat it even with antibiotics, so if you put them on higher dose of IPAG, they still, you can prevent a complication. You can or you can't? So we're going to switch gears here, and Aaron's going to talk about um, the research he's starting to do in combination with Steve Tillis on vocal cord dysfunction. Right. So actually, this is just a brief overview in Kate's presentation, and if there's time, I can talk about my research project and then what no disclosure is. The objectives of this talk are to understand the common presentations of vocal cord dysfunction, review the differences. It's well known that it can mimic asthma, but it is actually a distinct disorder. Uh, it may coexist with asthma, with, which makes it more difficult to diagnose. Asthma medications typically do little, if anything, to relieve vocal cord inflammation symptoms. You get variable flattening of the inspiratory flow volume loop on spirometry, and this can be strongly suggestive of BCD, but it's difficult to actually catch in practice. Uh, diagnosis. chest tightness and cough. They may awaken the patient at night. Known triggers are exercise, cold air, viral URIs, allergens, irritants such as smoke, chemicals, perfume, or other strong scents, emotional stress, and weather changes. The symptoms typically respond to inhaled bronchodilators as well as systemic uh, or inhaled corticosteroids, and spirometry will often reveal the reversible intrathoracic airflow. This, in comparison, is Similar symptoms, but are typically more of an acute onset and offset. You also uh, see different uh, voice changes, such as hoarse voice or kind of a hot potato voice. Patients describe more difficulty with.
inspiration and expiration, and if you ask them to point exactly where they're feeling tightness or pain, usually it's their throat versus their chest. Uh, triggers are very similar for vocal cord dysfunction and asthma, uh, including exercise, cold air, and irritants, and also emotional distress. The difference is that the symptoms of BCD do not typically respond to inhaled bronchodilators or steroids, and the spirometry can reveal extrathoracic airflow obstruction, uh, but again, This came out in 2014, it's called the Pittsburgh BCD Index, and this is a scoring system based on symptoms of the patient. So you can see uh, dysphonia, absence of wheezing, throat tightness, and odors identified as a trigger, and a score greater than three is more consistent with vocal cord dysfunction uh, than asthma. Uh, this is just a diagram of a normal larynx. You can see vocal cords, false vocal cords, retinoids, retinoid space and epiglottis. With vocal cord dysfunction, I'll focus mostly on the vocal cords and retinoids. Uh, basically, it's a paradoxical inspiratory larynx motion that causes vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, and on, this is a normal, so someone at rest, breathing, taking a big breath in, you can see the vocal cord, cords excuse me, are nice and open, versus uh, the same patient during exercise uh, who had the narrowing here, and this is an inspiration. So normal inspiration at rest, and then their inspiration exercise, which triggered their symptoms. And that brings me to my cases. Uh, the first case is a 16-year-old female. She was a competitive soccer player, and she started noticing wheezing and shortness of breath after about 10 minutes of high-intensity exercise. She was seen by a primary care doctor and had variable relief with albuterol inhalers, but her symptoms typically would resolve with rest. She had no cough at night, no nighttime awakenings, no known environmental triggers that would cause similar symptoms, and denied any acid reflexes. She had past mental history of eczema, but no other allergies or tropical diseases, no family history of asthma or early heart disease, only medications where Benadryl is needed and albuterol is needed, which again, she had variable relief from. Her physical exam was benign, She was able to perform the exercise stress test, and those of you who have worked with Dr. Tillis uh, or at least uh, spoken with him about this, they basically do a warm-up jog, a set of lines, and a set of sprints, and that's uh, used to try to trigger their symptoms that they get with their exercise. Um, after this patient was able to perform these exercises, there was an audible strider, uh, and she stated that these were her typical symptoms. She had wheezing and shortness of breath. We were able to run her inside and do a repeat endoscopy during these symptoms and it showed paradoxical motion of her vocal cords during inspiration. Uh, and these are a couple anatomical examples. So this is number one and this is with exhalation you can see the vocal cords here and the retinoids. And then with inspiration you can see the vocal cords are still pretty open but the retinoids here are triggering chest. And then on this one again normal with exhalation and with inhalation you can Case number two, and these cases are, uh, I'm using to highlight the two kind of different typical vocal cord dysfunction type patients. So the first one was a competitive athlete, and then this is case number two, uh, which is a 46-year-old woman who noticed throat tightness and difficulty breathing when exposed to strong scents in enclosed areas, such as elevators, public transportation, or the detergent aisle at the grocery store. She actually started noting this around Easter, a few years ago, when the lilies were she thought it was a lily allergy um, and it because she said she it got to the point where she couldn't even go to the grocery store floral section around Easter let alone a church she had been using albuterol multiple times a day uh, with some short-term relief she had been started on inhaled corticosteroids with no notice change in her symptoms uh, she had been trying to avoid scent exposure in public areas and she denied any prior history of asthma or Past medical history did include anxiety and depression, as well as acid reflux for which she was on treatment. Past surgical history is tubal ligation, family history, kind of the typical for the United States, hypertension, diabetes, and stroke. She did have previous skin prick tests because of that noticed uh, 
release of the trigger when these were all negative. The physical exam showed some mild nasal mucosa erythema, bilaterally pre discharge, but was otherwise normal. She had a normal baseline of aerogosis. Uh, she was unable to perform the exercise challenge due to deconditioning, and therefore we proceeded with the Foley challenge instead. Um, this did elicit inspiratory dyspnea and throat tightness, but only after we got to greater than 16 liters. We did a repeat laryngoscopy, and it did show paradoxical motion of the whole system. Um, this is just highlighting the different types of spirometry. So the first one here is normal. Uh, this would be a typical asthma type spirometry where you get the reversible intrathoracic, intrathoracic obstruction. Uh, and uh, one thing I want you to hope you would see, but again, it's not always present in these patients, even with symptoms. And you can see a flattening of the inspiratory flow loop here. There's no sign of obstruction at all with expiration. And the FEF50, FIF50 ratio is greater than two. Uh, and that brings me to a syndrome called irritable larynx syndrome. And this is a theory of why it is that people may get vocal cord dysfunction in the first place. So the thoughts are that a lot of things may uh, play a role, such as anxiety, postnasal drift, other irritants, acid reflux with exercise. And most of these are more of a mechanical process or thought to be. Um, you know, postnasal drift and irritants, that one is uh, kind of logical. You know, if something is irritating the vocal cords, then they're going to be more sensitive and more irritable. Anxiety, we're unsure how that actually plays a role. And in fact, uh, the more we know about vocal cord dysfunction, the more we see patients without any Exercise can kind of be twofold, whether it's an actual mechanical issue or also just the irritation of airflow through the vocal cords as well. Uh, treatment approach initially, you want to reassure the patient and educate them. A lot of individuals are not aware of vocal cord dysfunction, although this is getting uh, to be more common knowledge in the public. And then also, you know, they've been treated for asthma until they've had asthma symptoms for years, and it's difficult to maybe get through to them that this could be a different disease entity. It's important to discontinue the unnecessary medications. Again, depending on how responsive the patient is to the diagnosis of vocal cord dysfunction, this may be a quick thing or it may uh, be a gradual decrease over time as they respond to other therapies. And you also want to treat the underlying comorbidities such as rhinitis, postnatal drift, acid reflux, and anxiety as these may uh, the mainstay of treatment is speech therapy. Uh, typically, they'll go through different breathing techniques, and most of them will focus on proper exhalation, uh, which is kind of interesting to think because most people will complain their symptoms are occurring with inhalation. Um, but I spoke with a speech a pathologist about this in Alaska, and she said it's very important to get proper exhalation because if you're not emptying the air out appropriately, then you're not able to do normal inspiratory. Uh, therefore, you can focus on first lip breathing with exhalation. Uh, one of the tricks that uh, the speech pathologist taught me is that if you put your tongue kind of in front of your mouth, as if you'd had Novocaine or something, or, or had no control of your tongue, and then try to make a puff noise with exhalation, that will sometimes pop the vocal cords open. And then it will also allow them to take an inhalation um, using their abdominal, abdominal muscles uh, without even thinking about it. I'm going to focus on lower jaw. Well, diaphragmatic breathing instead of using the shoulders for the breathing, uh, relaxation of chest, shoulder, and neck muscles, and also, again, focus on the exhalation. Okay, let me just skip to the brief overview. Um, some of the research I'm doing with Dr. Tillis is hopefully going to be a prospective epidemiologic study with vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, we're going to recruit uh, competitive soccer players. basically looking at them before they develop vocal cord dysfunction and following them over the course of two years to see how many develop symptoms and if they develop any anxiety that correlates to those symptoms or asthma, et cetera, as we talk with them in the first group. Um, anything that we may be able to find some type of pattern to expect to help understand the disease. Um, and 
and then I was able to go last year this year, so I was talking to that team and we had some pictures there. Um, these were just some photos that we took. Uh, this was at the Alaska State Fair. Um, these are cabbage and rutabaga. Um, and because of their interesting growing season, they have these giant vegetables. And so the rutabaga, I think, is like 80 some pounds and the cabbages are over 100 pounds. Um, this was just a view from one of the, quote, easy hikes I was told to go on, which was Flat Top Mountain. And it was basically a rock scramble after you went straight up for about a mile. Can you see um, Russia from there? <laughs> <laughs> I waved. <laughs> um, so that was just a, we called it moderate difficulty. Um, this was actually in town. So I saw no moose on any of my hikes and basically no wildlife on any of my hikes. But if you went to any of these city parks, there were plenty. Um, this was, again, that same city park, just on the ocean there. Uh, Kaladi Brothers Coffee, which I had been to in Seattle, is actually from Alaska. Uh, and then they have one of the original tasting freezes, and it's actually still the most similar air conditioning in the United States. When you talked about speech therapy, did a speech therapist that you work with recommend doing the treatment under vocal cord visualization, or did she just do it in her office? She did both. Um, and she was a very good speech pathologist. She herself had suffered from vocal cord dysfunction, and so she would get out. She sees a lot of cross country runners because of where she works, as well as other more distance type athletes. And she said the problem she notices is a lot of times with women, it's more of the, almost a fatigue. So as they get into the exercise too later, it's more of the breathing mechanics. They'll use a lot more of their shoulder and accessory muscles. Whereas men will sometimes not get vocal cord dysfunction symptoms until after they're done exercising because they're able to maintain that muscle strength throughout. So it's, it's different. Um, she does a lot more with the mechanical. And even with a swimmer, all she would do is adjust someone's body position to get it done. She does have a treadmill and actual visual visualization in the office as well. But I think she does most of that with the initial visit. And then once they get into the therapy, they do more of it outside unless it's something that she really needs to show them and teach them. Does that answer your question? Sort of. Yeah, when, when this first presented, it was thought to always be just anxiety, and that's why it's evolved into this whole new spectrum. And one of the ENT surgeons at Swedish, what she does is she has her speech therapist do everybody under visualization. So she scopes them, and then she provokes them, and then she tries to teach them how to undo it while they're in the chair. Yes. And it's a, it sounds like it's a different approach than what you're taking, so I don't know if it is or not. So, and that depends. I know in Oregon... I think it just depends on what your resources are. All right, well, thank all three of you for stepping up yeah. and feeling. Um, I don't, there's nobody monitoring, so if there are any questions from outside, unfortunately, I don't have a mechanism of receiving them. But um, thanks again. For those who came in late, again, the parking will be available. Uh, but if you can find street parking, you save the division money. So only use it if there's nowhere to park. Um, I left it five I got here seven But I was driving more than parking. Yeah, yeah, I got right But right. then I went to the wrong room. Is it? Did you get a check? Yeah, I don't know. I have to ask the trip team for now. Because they supposedly sent it. So hopefully anyway, it's all done. Fair enough. Why it was just nice that there were less hassle this year. Yeah, having the whole check and all the letter. We told them what account to put it in. That worked out. Yeah, because we can get way ahead of the parking. So I'll just keep a copy of it. I didn't open your mail or anything. Yeah, three, I'm sure it does. She says it was an hour. Does anybody know what next week's presentation is? Because <laughs> you just buy some cups.
Yeah, that's right. So, David, I just sent a patient to you guys who is basically a patient. You can play that game. A 40 year old lady, she's got two kids in her IG because she's IG because she never did bad, and all of a sudden started getting sick. That's right. Prophylactic antibiotics has no response to it. That would work well. So, basically, she could have been your only problem. Yeah, but anyway, I'm saying, she doesn't want to do that. You can look at all these men out. So she's coming down to see you, but I told Drew that when the adults yeah. call now, they get into you. Yeah, that's right. They're all sent to the U. They don't get into you guys until Drew is going to get all the referrals. Well, she just told me that yesterday. No, so I when I called the schedule, they said I have to see this doctor here. But if we try to get her to see you guys, and they diverted her over to she's an adult, and she has told she had to go to the U. You and the ones without insurance go to you. Oh, they have to get a special dispensation to go to doctors. If they sound more complicated, yeah, that's what Drew said. Drew said as soon as they're complicated, I send them to you anyway. But is it? I mean, what? Is, what's the thought there? Is there people that all of a sudden just tank it? Is there T cells just start dropping out over time? I don't know the T cell the reason. I'm not it's an autoimmune disease. I mean, that's something that you can do from the. Oh, that's right. Okay. Two kids both have IG deficiency. Well, you want to study all of them? She's um, Which is interesting because she was doing fine for a while with prophylactic antibiotics. Basically, I said when you get sick, treat yourself. And when you're not sick, don't treat yourself. 